All right, welcome back to Mr. Frantrick's AP Staff Class, Period 2. It's been a while since I've recorded, because since you last heard my voice, I've had another baby! Yay! All right, today's performance is dedicated to Miss Byrne. All right. And our child. Okay. So, here are the things we're going to be talking about over, say, this week, but it's a day and two-thirds, so not much left. You should recognize almost all of these except for the very last one. Go ahead and put a little star next to that last one. Our circle, letter E, whatever you want to do. Just make sure you know that's new this week. All right? You guys, hopefully, if you were here yesterday, you had a chance to read Chapter 21, or you've already read it or did it in your own time, where you're talking about uh, or learning about these Type 1 and Type 2 errors. So I will be... I'm um, going into more detail about that today, as well as I'm going to tell you a story, true story in my life, where I've encountered using type 1 and type 2 errors. Okay? True story. Always true in here. Okay. Now, let's start by talking about the null hypothesis. You learn about this just over a week ago. All right? And this is where you always have to start by defining your parameter and then setting it equal to some value. And in this case, we're talking about proportions. So, for example, we had the null hypothesis is P equals, let's use 0.4. Okay? The proportion of all cars in Houston that are red. That's what I think is the best idea of what's going on. I think 40% of them are red. Do I know if that's true? No, I don't. Right? But based on uh, contacting all of the manufacturers of cars in Houston and the dealers and dealerships, everyone, all that stuff. I'm going with 40%. Okay? Now, we don't know if that's true, but we think that's the best idea of what's going on. So I put some more bullet points down here to show you how you want to set this up. These are the three kind of main ones here. You want to make sure that if you're trying to prove something, you always want to make that the alternative. All right, you always want to make that the alternative because we can reject the null, but we can never say the null is true. All right, at best we can say that the null is the best idea of what's going on, but I'm never going to say it's true. All right, so when you're setting these problems up with the hypotheses, just ask yourself, what do I want to try to prove? And that should be the alternative. Now, when you're doing this, you do have some options for the alternative. All right, what are some options? that I could put for the alternative symbol here. Say it again. Greater than? Not equal to? And less than. Those are the three options. All right, how do you know which one to choose? According to the problem. Read the problem, right? Trying to find keywords that tell you uh, how to use it. What are some keywords for using greater than? No. More. More. Higher. Okay, greater, yeah. What about for less than? Less. Smaller, less, less. Smaller. decrease, slower. Great, these are all great words. What about for not equal to? Different. Different, right? I'm different. No, okay. What else? What's another one? Ooh, remember, yeah, last week we had dispute, right? We had dispute. Now, what if you don't know? What if you're in the AP test and you're like, oh no, I don't know what to do? What should you do if you don't know which one to pick? Why, Luis? Do you know? Ah, do you know why though? Why you should default to not equal to? So it does a two-tail test, and what does that do to your p-value? What does it do to your p-value if you have a two-sided? It doubles it. Very good, Suzette. And if your p-value is higher, that means it's more difficult to reject the null hypothesis. So basically you're saying that if you use not equal to, you're making it harder for the test to reject the null. So if you do reject the null, you feel more confident. So that's why if you're on the AP exam, you're like, oh, I don't know which one. Just do not equal to. OK? Question? It's all the work is exactly the same. Just your p-value will be double if someone had done less than or greater than. So your decision, your conclusion might be different. Right, because we're going to talk about remember that threshold, that alpha. Right, if your alpha, if your p value is below your alpha, you're going to reject the null. 
If it's above alpha, you're going to fail to reject. So by using the two-sided, it might cause a different conclusion. Not, no one, it's not wrong, just a different conclusion. Okay. P-values. Now you're writing down right now the very first statement up here. The very first statement up here. Why don't you write it like there? Put an arrow. Now I'm I'm gonna guarantee that this will come up on one of my exams from now until the end of school, where you have to understand and interpret a p-value. And it's one of those concepts that takes a while. It takes a while for our brains when we're 16, 17, 18, maybe 19, to understand what this means. Okay? So I've tried in the past to explain this. I'm going to try again. All right? Do my very best to help you understand a p-value. But as I've said before, if you want to understand these things, you, not, you cannot only just be in here and listen. You have to do some work on your own. Some reading on your own. Read your textbook. You can also read your Barron's review book, right? The one that you put under your bed and you haven't looked at for a while. All right, I have same thing, right? Same difference. All right, become make it your friend. Go everywhere with it. That's what I do. I take my stats book everywhere. But you don't need friends if you have your stats book. What did you say, Suzette? Yeah, I mean, they never talk. The book never talks back to me, right? It never calls me old. It's lying to you. So here's a p-value. Ready for this? Here's the p-value. When you interpret a p-value, you should first think to yourself that the null hypothesis is the best idea for what's going on. So what did I say is the best? percentage idea of what's going on in terms of red cars in Houston. 40%. Right now I think 40% of the cars, not good when I look out the window, are red. Okay? All right, there's only one. That's that. Now, let's say I run a sample and I find a statistic with that sample and I compare it. All right? Doing that is going to give me a z-score, which then gives me a p-value. And that p-value means that if I assumed 40% of all Houston cars are red, the likelihood that I would see that statistic from that sample is the p-value. Right? So when they're really, really small, when p-values are really, really small, right, then it's really unlikely that you would see that in a sample. So instead of saying, oh, it's just one of those you know, random chance moments, you're super unlucky, unlucky to get that actual statistic, we instead reject the null in favor of a new model, the alternative. Okay? So that's why we have that decision. So when you see here, this is what we did last week with our first example. Do you remember our first test we ever ran? Oh my God, we already forgot about our first test? What's your first test? you got to remember that for life. Oh my gosh, guys. My listeners are so upset right now. <laughs> it was the one about the smoke detectors in the homes. Oh, no, I wasn't here. Yeah, because I don't come to school. Uh, remember the smoke detectors? Oh, you guys had soccer, right? I'll allow it this once. All right. So with smoke detectors, we said that the p-value was so small, we rejected the null hypothesis. Now, what if you have a large p-value? What if you have p-values that are large? You fail to reject. Basically, you're saying, ho oh, hum, I expected that. If your p-value is 60% or 0.6, it's very likely that you would see that sample statistic. Nothing going on here. Nothing to see here. Nothing exciting. Just another sample that makes sense with my model. So that's why we fail to reject the null. We're going to get there, right? Yes, that's where we're. If you need, so what Marcelo's brain is already seeing is I'm using numbers. So there is a mathematical way to make these decisions, Marcelo. That way you don't have to leave it up to interpretation. All right? Now, you don't have this slide. I think it's going to happen. It did. Okay. So don't worry about writing this down. Or if you want to write down anything, you can flip it. Actually, no, I don't think I have any room 
Nope, you got no room. Don't write it down. You're good. It's all good. Don't worry about it. I've already mentioned all this stuff. Okay? There's the three most common alphas. This is the one that I use all the time, 0.05. It's the, just the one I use, the one my teacher used, and the teacher before him, and before him, right? Jesus, yes. Right? I, the original teacher. But Jesus' dad, was he a teacher? Or mom? Did, did Mary teach us? Mm, she sure did, right? All right? So be careful with that Jesus thing. Okay. You'll see point one. And 0.01, I'm trying to really like that one. And 0.01, you can use whatever whatever alpha level you want. I'm just telling you those are the most common. Do you remember the confidence levels? 95 and 90 and 99. Those are the three most common. All right. Could you use 87% confident? Yeah. Will you look silly? Yeah. Okay. It's all good. All right. So the alpha. Yeah. Yeah. Question. We're gonna get. We're about to get there. Your brain's all over it. So the way I think of it, and I think I explained this uh, last week, so I'm gonna do it again. All right. If you imagine the floor is zero, and the ceiling is one. Okay. Or imagine that floor is zero, ceiling is one. So all the values in between zero and one are here. Right. If your alpha is down here at 0 0.05, then your p value has to be below this to reject the null. So basically, you're saying if it has to be below this. Is that easy to do? That's easy to get something below this? It's hurting me right now, Marcelo. <laughs> it's not easy, all right? Our alpha at those values make it difficult to reject. All right, the reason we make it small is so that we can be confident that we're doing the right thing. All right, that's why alphas are very small. Yes? So like, what do you guys does that mean? Because it's like 10% and then 5% and then yeah. 5%. It's like, it's like 5% likely it's going to happen. Well, remember what a p-value is. A p-value is if I assume that the null hypothesis is my best model, then the likelihood that I would see this sample statistic, right, these results from a sample, is this p-value. So the p-value is a probability, and you're comparing it to these thresholds. So if you want to think of these as you know, a threshold for that, that's, that's what they are. All right? So anything below your alpha is going to be so unusual that we're better off rejecting what we thought was the best idea and going with something else. Okay? Like right now, if I look out of the window, I see one out two out of like 15 cars that are red. That's much lower than 40%. So I have to ask myself, is that enough evidence to say 40 is wrong and I should go with something lower than that? That's what a test is. Okay? Now, do you guys see the very last one? I mentioned this last week. Always include the p-value because you might interpret something differently. Somebody might want to use a different alpha, so just always include that p-value. I will take off points if you don't include p-value. Okay. All right, we're back to what you can write. Let's do this. So now, uh, this is for Luis. I think you said, is there a relationship between alpha and your confidence level? And the answer is yes. So I actually tried to do this uh, last week. I think it was last week. Yeah, last week. Feels third child. I don't know what day is there. Okay. Uh, I tried to do this last week, so I'm going to try again. All right. So let's go ahead and use that same example we just did. So P equals 0.4. I want to do a one sided test. So I'm going to have, let's see, uh, da, 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 uh, Lucero, can you give me what kind of one sided test you'd want to use here? What do you want to use here? Your choice. Excellent. Thank you very much. What's the other option she could have told me, Marcelo? What's the other option she could have told me that I would have been okay with? Not greater than or equal to, right? It's not algebra. Less than. Very good, right? Those are one-sided or one-tailed tests. So let's go ahead and draw that curve. Let's draw that curve. It doesn't need to be big. It need a small curve. All right. Hey, Joseph. Welcome. I think Luis already put the notes on your desk. You're good to go. All right. So if Lucero told us greater than, where am I going to shade in this curve? The right. So let's say our, our value is somewhere over here, and we shade this way. All right. Now, obviously, if I shade over here, this far to the right, 
I'm assuming you know a fairly large z-score, closer to three, two or three. All right. Now, let's have uh, Roberto. Can you give us an alpha level? What alpha level or significance level do you want to use? Um, All right, 0 0.05. Now, if we are doing a one-tailed test, all right, so we're going to compare. This is what George's brain was thinking. We need to compare this area right here. This is an area under the whole curve, so it's some value between 0 and 1. I need to compare this, it's a p-value, to what? What am I comparing that to? My alpha. So what my brain thinks is, okay, I'm comparing this. I want purple, I want red. I'm comparing this to 0 0.05. Now I put an arrow there, and I don't want you to think that it is 0 0.05. I want you to think I'm comparing it to 0 0.05. Okay? Everybody good? Now, if this tail I'm comparing to 0 0.05, I'm not using this tail, but what would that need to be compared to if I were to use this tail? I'm comparing this tail to what? 0 0.05. What should I compare this tail to? Actually, not negative 0 0.05. It's actually still going to be between 0 and 1. It's just the z-score will be negative. For whoever said that, the z-score will be negative. But that's fine. 0 0.05 as well. So what I'm trying to show you is that if you compare this to 0 0.05, and that's a 0 0.05, that's each 5%. What's 5% plus 5%? So what is left in between? 90. So if you wanted to run a confidence interval, you would use 90% for your confidence level. I'm telling you if you want to be statistically correct. All right, there are people out there, there are statisticians out there, I'm no, no joke. There are statisticians out there that will just use 95% all the time because they prefer it. But if you want to link it, if you want to you want to basically make the same conclusion, instead of running a test, you ran an interval, but to have the same conclusion, you need to make sure you link the confidence level. Yes? That's why we did the confidence interval and then the test, you're right. Can we try the two-sided or two-tail? Yes, everybody good? Okay, cool. All right, so let's go ahead and write our hypotheses again. Our null is stay the same. For a two-tailed, what is gonna be the symbol we're gonna use, Vincent, for the alternative? What's gonna go in between P and 0.4 for the alternative hypothesis for a two-tailed test? Two, so I need a shade in both directions. Would it be greater than or equal to? It's not greater than or equal to. Hold on, let's let him do it. So what are the three options? Lucero just told us greater than. Marcelo said this one could have been less than. So what's the other option here? And they can't use or equal to. Not just less than, because that one's up top. Up top, less than would be a one-tailed test. What would give me both directions? What if I want a greater than, but I also want a less than? What can I use? If I want greater than or less than? Aaliyah? Not, not equal to. Vincent, what should I use? Not equal to. Very good. Not equal to. That gives you both directions. Okay, so let's draw the curve. Come here. So how am I shading on this one? Both tails. both tails, both sides. Very good. All right, let's see if anyone wants to get crazy. Stephanie, give me an alpha. Ooh, Stephanie, getting crazy in here. Alpha. Every student, Stephanie, every year I do this. There's never a student that wants to get crazy, so I appreciate you. She said alpha is 0.1. Wild and crazy over here, Stephanie. I love it. Everyone just says 0.05 because they're scared of what might happen. I love it. 0.1. Let's mix it up a bit. Let's get kooky. Appreciate you. All right, so the previous problem, I compared just this tail to 0.05, but now I'm comparing both tails to 0 0.1.
So I'm not going to put 0 0.1 in each. I need to split this, split this into both. So instead of putting 10% in each, what am I going to split it into? 5% in each. What? So I'm going to use 5%, so 0.05. That's the p-value. I'm not talking about the confidence level. Oh my goodness, George! It's the same level. But guys, was it the same process to get there? No! Oh my gosh, Stephanie, awesome. I love it. Now, you may be thinking, ooh, I'm not sure I can do that. We're going to make sure you can, all right? Because the AP exam loves a question like this. So do I, to be honest. I, I teach. Okay. Wait, but, so what would have happened if you were to just like 0.01? Ooh! George, should we do it? Should we do it? George wants to get super crazy. <laughs> should we get super crazy? Like, cray squared? George said, okay, Stephanie. I see your point 0.1, and I say, what about point zero 0.01? Ah! Okay? <laughs> so if it's point zero 0.01, split that, George, into two. What's point oh 0.01 split into two? Point zero zero 0.005? Yeah. What's point zero zero 0.005 and another point zero zero 0.005? One percent? So what level would I have used? Ninety-nine percent! Woo! Man, I'm feeling good. Isn't this exciting, Joseph? Okay. How do you get to 95 covered? Mm, how do you get to 95 then for two sided? So this was like, this is Papa Bear too big. Here's Mama Bear too small. You got. <laughs> Let me try again. Papa Bear too big. Baby Bear too small. So Mama Bear. 0.05, just right. I should not do the bears next time. Note to self, no more bears. Got it. Right, ooh, gummy bears. Ooh, remember gummy bears? Oh, man, they're so good. Did, did you hear that? So it would be 0.05 to get 95%. All right, so I need you to basically be able, if I gave you the hypotheses and alpha, you should be able to tell me what the confidence level should be if I want to run a confidence interval. Okay? That's what you need to be able to do. Yeah. That's what most students get have trouble with. You're like, wait, I thought it was one tail. The way I want you, I want you to think the tails, if it's one sided, the tail gets all the alpha. Your tail gets the whole alpha. Oh. So we match it in the other tail. Right? In the two sided, your tails didn't get the whole alpha. The, the, we split it. A tail got half of the alpha. Wait, so if you use the, the uh, 0 0.01 on the one side. Oh, I mean, George is just doing all the problems now. If we use 0 0.01 here, it'd be 0 0.01 here, 0 0.01 here. What would be in between? 98%, right? Because it's 1%, 1%. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, 0 0.1. 0.1. So if it's 0 0.1 here, 0 0.1 here, then it would be 80%. All right. Can we stop there? Because yeah. we're running out of iterations. OK, cool. <laughs> Or you're gonna ruin my chance to give this to you on a like an exit ticket, okay? Is it though? All right, let's keep going. Now we've come to the last part of my lecture, talking about making errors. All right. Now I want to be very clear about this. I don't want you to think this error is a bad thing, okay? No, scratch that. I do want you to think of it as a bad thing. But I don't want you to think of it as something you can really avoid. Okay? These errors are unavoidable. They always exist when you run a test. So what I try to teach students is to think back to your first test. All right? What was our first test we did last Tuesday? The smoke detectors, right? Do you remember our conclusion? Do you remember what we concluded about our hypotheses? We rejected the null in favor of the alternative. But what if we were wrong. What if we shouldn't have done that? That's called a type 1 error. Okay? So rejecting the null when you shouldn't have is called a type 1 error. 
All right. A type 2 error is when you fail to reject the null when you should have done what? You should have rejected it. That's a type 2 error. All right. So some students like this table. I'll be honest, I don't. All right. But I put it there because some students say, oh, I like the table. I'd rather not do that. I'd rather think about my first test I ever ran. Because every student in stats, their first course, what do you think they always do with their first ever test? They always reject the null. The teacher always shows them a problem where they reject the null. Okay? So say to yourself, type 1 error is reject the null, but I shouldn't have rejected it. Type 2 error, fail to reject the null, I should have rejected it. That's type 2 error. Okay? Now, last slide. We talked about our uh, alpha, our significance level. All right? Let's think about what alpha is. Imagine alpha again down here, right? Alpha's down here. What if my p value is below it? What am I going to do if p value is below alpha? Reject the null in favor of the alternative. But what if I did that wrong and I shouldn't have done that? What's that called? A type 1 error. So that's why if you read the very first thing, type 1 error is alpha. Type 1 error is alpha. All right? So if you use 0.05, you've got a 5% chance of committing a type 1 error. If you use 0 0.01, you've got a 1% chance of committing a type 1 error. So you can choose, right? Let's say you wanted to reduce your type 1 error. You would use a smaller alpha, okay? Now, do you guys remember type 2 error? Type 2 error, we're going to use the next letter, which is beta. So alpha, then beta, all right? Every time that you choose an alpha, you're also choosing a beta, Okay? There's always this balance and tension between them. You guys ever done like a tug of war? Like in PE, maybe when you're in grade school, elementary school? Right? Is that, maybe you can't do that anymore because kids get hurt? I don't know. I don't know. It's been a long time. I'm not sure. All right? But you remember the tug of war? So if you want to lower alpha and make it even harder to reject your null, that's good in the sense of you're reducing your type 1 error. But what are you increasing? Your type 2 error, because there might have been a p-value that you don't think is low enough, but man, you probably should have actually rejected that null. So that's a type 2 error. All right? So there's always this balance going on between the two. Yeah. So is it more likely for you to get a type 2 error since there's more space? Because that's only like 5%. Interesting. Um, it's not more, it really depends on the problem, right? And yes, it does depend on what you decide your threshold to be. Yes, if you make alpha tiny, 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 then you've reduced your type 1 error, but you have increased your type 2, yes. So if I made alpha 0.5 right in the middle, you're kind of making them somewhat equal. But that, we don't usually use that because if you tell me p-value is 0.42, that's not small. That doesn't really help me, you know? Okay, now there's one more thing I want to mention before we finish, and that's this bullet point here, talking about the power of a test. What I tell students is the power of a test is the ability for your test to do the right thing, to reject the null when it should. All right, the power of a test is the ability for your test to reject the null, and it did it right. That was the correct thing to do. All right, all you need to know for this intro course is this formula here for power. So if you change alpha, watch this crazy ripple effect. If you change alpha, what does that affect? Beta. And if you change beta, what does that affect? The power of your test. So it's all related. All right, so how good or strong your test is is determined by what you decide your alpha to be. All of these things are related. All right, what I want you to do right now is to put your pen or pencil down and we're going to transition to my story. All right. Thanks for listening out there. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, tune in. Probably not tomorrow, so I'll catch you next week for Dose Proportions.